Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Solid Food Bible Study. Glad you're with us today, and uh, like last week, we want you to just take a look at what you're looking at now and see if you see something that might be a little bit different than uh, it was the week before. Now, last week, somebody got the thing that was different, and it was the golf cart that's sitting here on my desk, and uh, that was uh, Barb Shepard. She was the first one to identify that the golf cart was the thing that was different, and we still have it here uh, this week. Uh, so she'll get a special prize uh, for that. Uh, John Miller uh, also got it right, but he called it the Fred Flintstone Mobile. And we can't have Fred Flintstone anywhere identified with golf, and so uh, John was disqualified. So Barb will get that uh, special prize for identifying what was different in the office. Now, something is different today. Now, I honestly believe that no one is going to get this one. But believe me, there is something different in what you're seeing right now that is different than last week. Now, let me give you a hint. It is nothing on the desk, okay? So the desk, I think, is just about the same as it was last week. So it's something else that you're looking at that's different than last week. See if you can identify it, put it in the comments uh, section. And uh, if you're the first, and if you are, I believe you'll be the only one who will identify what's different uh, this week. Well, uh, let me give you just a word about my wife, B. Uh, she's still in the hospital, will be there at least through this week and perhaps a little bit longer, uh, but she's making slow progress. Uh, her left hand and left arm are able to be moved now. She can raise it up and do things with her left hand. And uh, her speech is uh, pretty much back to normal. And uh, she has a little bit of problem when she's talking uh, of just stopping a little bit and thinking about what she wants to say and, and then going ahead and, and uh, saying it. Uh, you know, for 50 years, I've dealt with people in hospitals, many people who have had strokes, and, and uh, I sympathize with them, and I try to encourage them and everything. But you know something? It's completely different when it's your own family that's going through it. And so this is a different experience for me, and uh, so I'm so glad to see that B is progressing. Uh, she needs a lot of help with just being able to get up and walk and so uh, that's primarily what they're working on now. And so continue to pray for me, continue to pray for me, and uh, we'll, we'll get through this thing. B's a tremendous witness for the Lord, and uh, she's been doing that this time uh, while she's in the hospital. Uh, I don't know whether you realized it last week or not when we were talking about Samson. <laughs> I watched the the program, and I, I remembered what happened during the Bible study. I was talking about Samson and uh, how his eyes were put out, and uh, in, in his death, he caused more people to die than he did during his life. And for the life of me, when we were talking about Samson, I could not think uh, who the woman was that uh, caused his eyes to be put out. I was thinking about uh, Jezebel. I was thinking about all other things. You don't realize when I'm talking to you what's going on back here in my mind. And I was just going through all of the women in the Bible that I could think of, and I could not think of Delilah. And so while I'm trying to think of her name and saying what I was saying, I finally says, said he, his eyes were put out by that woman. Oh my goodness. It was a cover up and I don't know whether you noticed it or not. I remember a Bible test that I gave one time in high school when I was teaching Bible back at Temple Christian. And I put on the test the question, who named Moses? And uh, most of the kids got it. But uh, one uh, guy put on his test paper 
uh, an answer that I was really confused about. And I asked him about it. I said, why did you put that answer down to the question, who named Moses? And he said, well, you know, I didn't know really whether it was Pharaoh's wife that named Moses or Pharaoh's daughter that named Moses. And so he wrote on his test paper the answer, Pharaoh's woman. And I felt a little bit like him uh, last week. Well, you know, this is kind of a nostalgic month for me. Uh, most of you know that uh, I had planned uh, originally uh, about a year ago or so to retire this month, the month of June in 2020, for it was the first Sunday in July that I took my first church and preached my first sermon as a pastor. And so the end of this month would be the end of 50 years of pastoring churches. Now the Lord changed my plans. Uh, he said, I think you need to hang on just a little bit longer, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I can continue on ministering to you folks on uh, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Tuesday mornings, uh, things like that. Uh, but I had originally planned uh, to uh, retire, and so this month would be the end of 50 years in pastoral ministry. Now, that doesn't count uh, the times of ministry in college, the five and a half years that I spent there, uh, going out on weekends and preaching and everything. Uh, this would be the end of 50 years of pastoring churches. Now, I've been a very privileged individual in the ministry, uh, for I have only served in three churches in 50 years. That's almost unheard of. We know some guys do pastor the entire time of their ministry in one church, but the, over uh, the average, high over the average, would be uh, pastors who uh, are in many, many, many different churches during their ministry. Uh, I was in my first church for seven and a half years. Most of you have heard about that, a little church that started in a firehouse. We even had a fire one Sunday morning during Sunday school. The volunteer firemen were running up and down the aisles, pulling on their raincoats and, and things. And, and uh, so that was the, the, the beginning of that. And uh, then the second church was seven and a half years down in Spencerville. And now I've had the privilege uh, of being here at the Lima Baptist Temple for 35 years. Almost unbelievable. 35 years have gone by. And uh, God has given me a, a great privilege of serving Him in the ministry uh, for 50 years. And, and so I have been thinking over these past weeks and, and months of different things that have happened uh, during uh, my ministry. Uh, different things that the Lord brought to my mind that have been uh, very instrumental in what I have done. I remember sitting at my desk in my bedroom. I had just gotten my application to uh, college at Bob Jones University, and I was sitting there looking at it, and I had my Bible open, over here on the one side, the application was right here. I could see it like it was yesterday. And uh, I came to a part in the application that said, state your purpose in life. Now, I had planned up until that time to go away to college and become an English teacher. The furthest thing from my mind was being involved in pastoral ministry. For you see, as I have told you many times, I am a very shy individual. I am very uncomfortable around people that I do not know. And to think, not only would I have to talk to people, but also I would have to get up in front of people and talk. And not only talk for a few minutes, but talk the entire length of a lesson or a sermon. 
Oh, that was almost incomprehensible to me. I am like a lot of you are. Someone has said that the greatest fear that a person has is the fear of public speaking. It exceeds the fear of death, the fear of disease. People fear getting up and having to say something before other people. And so that's the way I was. And, and I was just sitting there and thinking, uh, that's why I, I, I wanted to be an English teacher. I, I, I thought, well, if I have to say anything, after the first year or two, things will become rather commonplace and ordinary, and I'll be able to go over those things without really any intimidation. Well, I looked over at my Bible, and in my Bible I saw this verse. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. Now, the verse did not jump out at me. There was no fire encircling the verse. No voice sounded from heaven. But when I read that verse, I knew that God was ministering to my heart. Let me read you this verse. It says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. Imagine the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian, no doubt, who ever lived, thinking of himself as less than the least of all the saints. Now, if there was anyone who ever felt that way, it was me. And I'm looking at that verse and I'm thinking to myself, the way I feel is the way the Apostle Paul felt also. Amazing. Paul identified himself in many different ways. He says he was the least of all the apostles. He was not even worthy to be considered as an apostle. Over in the book of 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners, and then Paul said this, of whom I am the chief. In other words, Paul considered him not only considered himself not only the, the greatest of sinners, but the least of all those who had come to know Jesus Christ. And immediately I thought, you know, Paul was a lot like me. And he goes on to say, he who was the least of all the saints had this grace given to him. Not self-capability, not uh, any ingenuity that he possessed, but grace, the unmerited favor of God, was granted unto him that he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And that verse spoke to my heart, and it seemed like God said, Gary, that's what I want you to do. Now, I've oftentimes told people that I am well aware that God has never, ever made a mistake. God is perfection. But I thought when I read that verse and tried to apply it to me, I looked up and I said, God, if that's really what you want me to do, I think that you have made your first mistake. And yet I knew that's what God had said to me. I tried to talk myself out of it. I even called people on the phone and said, you know, I'm going away to Bible school. And, and I'm thinking that maybe God wants me to go into the ministry but, you know, I don't know that much about the Bible. I'm sure there are thousands of kids that are going to school who know so much more about the Bible than I do that I couldn't ever learn enough to be able to do what God wants me to do. And those people encouraged me. They said, no, you can do it. If God wants you to do it, then do it because God doesn't make mistakes. And so I did. I went away to school. I spent five and a half years, four years of undergraduate work, and then a year and a half of seminary, and uh, went out 
and begin to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And what a blessing God has been in my life, enabling me over 50 years to only be in three locations. I hate to move. Do you hate to move? And I hate to move. I oftentimes said, when difficulties and problems come, it's far easier for those who are dissatisfied to move their membership than it is for me to move my furniture. <laughs> I just hate to move. And so God has enabled me to take a little uh, beginning church, that, that church that I took when I first came out of school was 13 adults. <laughs> Can you imagine that? We met in a firehouse. We, our songbooks were old songbooks that another church wanted to get rid of. Half of the pages were gone in some of them. Uh, the chairs were just old chairs that other churches had. They didn't even all look the same. The pulpit uh, I used was a music stand. And as many of you know, it met in an old firehouse. And we had to sweep the building out on Sunday morning, move the trucks out, set up the chairs, have church Sunday morning and Sunday night, and then uh, move all the fire trucks back into the uh, building. Uh, one fellow came to preach, and he said, you know, this is the only church that I have ever heard of that has so much fire in the pulpit that they have to keep a fire truck right next to it. But God bless there, we built a building and everything uh, really progressed well. Uh, came over to Spencerville, spent seven and a half years down there at Hartford Christian Church. And then God called us up here in uh, uh, 19, uh, what was that, 1985. Uh, called us up here to teach at the school. One too long after I began teaching at the school that the position in the Heritage Bible class opened up. And uh, I took a class up there, of uh, just middle-aged couples, and uh, God bless that tremendously. We ran somewhere around 200 uh, in that class. And then, uh, by his grace, he called me to be senior pastor here. Then after five years of doing that, I became the New Horizons pastor, ministering to the senior saints of our church. And uh, that's where I'm at now. So it has been quite a journey, and I praise God for what he has done for B and I during this time. It's an honor and privilege. I wouldn't trade it for anything. If someone would say to me, would you trade what you have done for something else that you could have done? I would say absolutely not. For the things that you amass in this world, the Bible said they're going to pass away. Uh, but God has done some tremendous work in people's lives and has enabled me to be a part of that. One thing I'd like to share with you this morning as I look back uh, on uh, 50 years of ministry, and that is, uh, I was thinking the other day, what uh, is the best sermon that you have ever heard uh, in all of your preparation? Now, I can honestly say the best sermon I ever heard was before I became a part of the pastoral ministry. It was when I was in college. We used to have a week in college that was called Bible Conference. It took the place of spring break at other colleges. We didn't have a spring break. They do now, but we didn't then. Spring break was really called Bible Conference, and it was a pretty tough week. No classes, but during that week, we had a, a message at 9 o'clock, one at 10.30, another one at 1.30 in the afternoon, and another one at 7 in the evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, can you imagine going to church four times a day for a solid week, but that's what we did. And we had pastors and, and preachers from all over the country, all over the world really, came to Bible conference and they would speak in those sessions that we had. Well, one day a man by the name of 
uh, Bob Ketchum uh, came to preach. And Bob Ketchum was one of the organizers of what is called the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches. Uh, some of you are familiar with uh, churches that are called G-A-R-B-C. Uh, the, these churches were founded by a group of men. Bob Ketchum was one of them. And Dr. Ketchum had a unique uh, disability. Uh, his eyes were terrible. And when he read, he, he would have to take his Bible and he would have to get about that close. I mean, right up to it in order to read what uh, he had uh, to say. And, and so he got up one day and uh, he preached from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3 was his text for that day. And I want to tell you, I can still see him standing in the pulpit. I could tell you where I was sitting in the auditorium, and I listened to him preach that message. Holding his Bible right up against his eyes, he read this verse. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And he called that sermon, gave it the title, The High Cost of Writing Paper. And he described the process that was necessary in taking a tree that stood in the forest and following it through the process of becoming a fine box of writing paper that you would buy and that you would write upon. What a process. And he described how the tree would be cut down Many times it would be floated down to the sawmill, and there it would be uh, uh, refined. All the rough edges would be taken out, and the process would be completed, whereby uh, eventually that tree that stood there uh, rugged out in the forest would now be a piece of fine writing paper. And he said to us, he said, that's exactly the process that is necessary for you and for me, who are described in this verse as the epistle or the letter of Christ, that, that we should be able to be identified by the world as the message of Jesus Christ to them. And, and we are identified to them, uh, not in tables of stone, not in a box of writing paper, but from our hearts we give testimony to the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and tell them, as the commission of Jesus Christ is to all of us, about his mercy and grace that they can possess in their life. Notice he says, we are declared to be the epistle of Christ, uh, not written with ink, but with the Spirit of God and the fleshly tables of our heart have been changed by the mercy and grace and the blood of Jesus Christ so that we can live a life of honor to him and be a testimony to his grace. What a wonderful sermon. I can hear it yet today. But you know the most interesting part of that sermon took place after the service was over. And I was standing with a group of guys outside the auditorium and Dr. Ketchum walked out. And one of the guys went over to him and began to compliment him on that message and tell him that it was wonderful how he lifted up the name of Jesus 
and challenged us to serve the Lord and be a testimony for him. Now, when I heard what the uh, guy said to Dr. Ketchum, I thought Dr. Ketchum's going to say, well, thank you. That's a very fine compliment. But do you know what he said? He looked at the young man and he said, son, that's what preaching is all about. And that changed my life. I had heard a tremendous sermon, and then I heard the preacher say, that's what preaching is all about. And I dedicated myself at that time, knowing I had been called to the ministry, to take the Word of God and be able to look at it and to identify what it says and then make the Word of God practical and profitable to the people who would hear it. What was done to the fine box of writing paper? That it was taken, it was broken, it was refined, and then it was used is the same message that has been the most used message that I have ever preached in 50 years in churches. For what I like to do, my favorite message is the message of the Lord Jesus Christ taking the lunch of that little boy. I preached on that just a couple of weeks ago. Taking that lunch. And what he did with that lunch was he took it, he broke it. The Bible says he took the loaves and the fishes and he broke them. And then he blessed them and then he used them. And that's what God needs to do in your life and in my life and in all those who desire to be successful and to become a letter, an epistle of Jesus Christ that others can read and see what a life is like that's been transformed by the grace of God. He needs to take us in salvation. I trust that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior today. And if you don't, a simple prayer. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Jesus' sake, is a prayer that is sufficient to produce salvation in your life. If you don't know Jesus today, would you not call out to him today? The Bible says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. He must take us and then he must break us. In other words, he must make us submissive to his will, whatever it be. That will that I had determined was going to be used in a life of teaching in school. He broke that and said, no, here's where I want you to be. And I said, okay, Lord, whatever it is you want me to be, I'm willing to do it. That's where he wants all of us. Whatever it takes, we say to God, and God breaks us and uses us. And then he has to bless us, just like he took that lunch. And the Bible says he blessed it. He prayed over it. So he blesses us, and then he used it. He used five loaves and a few fish to feed a hungry multitude, probably upwards of fifteen to 20,000. And oh, I think sometimes how useless I feel. And yet God says, the line is not long of volunteers who will serve me. I will use you if you will just allow me to do that in your life. He will use us, and God will bless us. As I look back over 50 years of pastoral ministry, I see so many times in my life that God just intervened. God spoke up at a particular time to challenge me to change my life, to change my desires, and to use me. And it's been accomplished over these past 50 years. From first Sunday in July of 1970 
to the last Sunday of June, the year 2020. It's been a great journey, and I praise God for his blessings. Thank you for letting me share just a few of those here this morning. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you again next week.